Unmute your line. Press Timber. star six or pound um, six. Is, um, a one hour on um, different opportunities in, in different clean energy sectors, wind, solar, battery, advanced tra transportation, etc. So that will be uh, an exciting agenda. And then we will be announcing our October through December webinar uh, topics uh, in the next couple of weeks. Um, this morning we have a great panel um, for you. Uh, Ted Clutter, the Manager of Outreach Services at the Geothermal Exchange Organization. Herb Vitruni, the Senior VP of Asia Pacific Operations at Water Furnace International. And David Heinrich, the VP at Bergerson Caswell, Inc. Um, at the end of an hour, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions, and uh, Linda will be taking these questions online. Um, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Ted. Ted? Okay, I just want to make sure, can everyone hear me okay? We can. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, very good. Uh, I'd like to go to my point present. Uh, is my PowerPoint presentation coming up for everyone okay? Still waiting to see it. Uh, I guess I'm controlling it from my desktop through my own computer. Right. I've got it up. Oh, you, no. And we're not seeing it yet, Ted. Hmm. Share, sharing the application. I'm sorry for the confusion. I thought I just had to bring it up on the screen. Ah, share my desktop. Got it. Excuse me, folks. There we go. That all look fine to you now, Linda? I'm not there. Okay. okay. No, it showed up. Thanks. Go, go, go for it. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, as has already been noted, uh, my name is Ted Clutter. I'm with the Geothermal Exchange Organization. We're the primary trade group for the geothermal heat pump industry in the United States, a nonprofit. I'd like to thank Linda and Dana and Jacques for the uh, opportunity to present with CM, CEMC this morning. Uh, Linda, I'm having a little technical problem here. I'm I'm very sorry. Um, why can't I advance my slides? Aha. Okay, I figured it out. Sorry, folks. Okay, as I said, we're the voice of the geothermal heat pump industry in the United States. We're primarily involved with the advocacy, but also partnerships. We have common interests with allies for strength in numbers. Important to that effort is the international ground source heat pump association and also the National Groundwater Association of which David is quite familiar. Um, we are uh, very interested in public relations and outreach and also promotion of quality and training and certification and accrediting our, our uh, equipment and our installers and so forth. We're working towards that goal continuously. So I'd like to give you an overview of geothermal heat pumps in a, geo, a simple 101 course. It's going to last just a few minutes, but hopefully you'll get the, uh, the idea of what we are and what we can do. Uh, integral to the discussion is the fact that buildings dominate U.S. energy use, especially for heating, cooling, and water heating. Uh, on the right-hand side of the slide, you'll see that according to DOE, we're approximately 39% of primary energy consumption amongst all sectors in, in the United States for buildings. And of that, thermal loads are about 
17% of total energy use in the United States. That's for heating, cooling, and hot water. And following on that is 20% of carbon emissions. People are very uh, concerned about climate change and so forth these days. Um, so that's important as well. And geothermal heat pumps, because of our efficiency, uh, we can do a, a lot. We can go very far to uh, reduce the, the uh, heating and cooling loads of buildings and make buildings much more efficient in their energy use. There's a lot of attention to energy uh, efficiency these days in presidential orders and amongst agencies and so forth. Uh, so we're following that closely and working with uh, politicians to, uh, to promote geothermal heat pumps through that process. But what are they? Uh, geothermal heat pumps are a heating and cooling system for buildings that harness the sun's renewable energy that's stored in the ground right beneath our feet. Uh, if you've ever noticed, uh, if you've ever been in a mine or if you've dug down in the ground a few feet, that is pretty constant temperature, and I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, geothermal heat pumps help our environment. They save energy. They cut fossil fuels, and I've, as I've mentioned, they reduce carbon emissions. And it's pretty simple. Underground temperatures are cooler than the outside air in the summer and warmer than the outside air in the winter, so we pull that energy from the earth and, and also expel our excess energy from the house or the building in the summertime, that heat into the earth. Uh, it's, it's appropriate that I mention right now what geo-exchange isn't, is not. Uh, we're often confused because we use the term geothermal. We're often confused with uh, deep <clears throat> geologic hot water or, and steam that, and especially in the West, is often drilled and used to power uh, power plants. Uh, we are not a power production technology. We are a thermal technology uh, using the uh, latent energy of the sun in the near surface of the ground, near surface of the earth, to heat and cool buildings. Uh, you notice at the bottom of this slide that Patrick Hughes with the uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory has said that heat transfer from the ground or recycled from waste streams by a GHP, that's a geothermal heat pump system, is just as renewable as geoheat and far more economical, and that indeed is true. We don't have the capital expense of power plants like the one shown in the photograph. Uh, we are uh, quietly uh, installed every day uh, right down the street from where you are, and the only way you'll ever know that a geothermal uh, system was installed in a building is if you were there the day that the, uh, the ground loops were installed or drilled. As I mentioned, the Earth is a vast solar collector, and this slide shows it pretty well, that solar energy maintains near constant temperature year-round within a few feet of the Earth's surface. 46% of the sun's energy is absorbed by the ground. So you get down four or five feet in the mid-latitudes, you're looking at about a 55-degree temperature regime. This slide's used in many presentations, but it's, uh, the reason is that it graphically shows it so that in our area across the, the central United States, you're looking at about a 52 to 57 degree temperature regime, just a few feet below your feet. So the basic is, I've already explained it, but this shows it, is that heat pumps circulate water through a sealed pipe loop underground, and it's either warmed or cooled by the earth, and that, that temperature is either expelled into the earth in the summer or brought into the building in the winter. Uh, the units inside the house look similar to the ones shown here. There are various brands. Uh, major manufacturers include Water Furnace, uh, Entertech, and Climate Master. Uh, they're self-contained units. They efficiently heat and cool. They use standard duct systems and thermostats, and they're, so that makes them great for retrofitting of old buildings to make them more efficient. Not enough time to really explain in detail how geothermal heat pumps work, but suffice it to say that, according to, as you can see in this diagram, that you have uh, supply and return air from the unit itself, uh, and the unit is using the ground loop uh, beneath the, uh, the units in this picture to uh, either disperse the heat, as I've mentioned, or absorb the heat from the ground, depending on the season. Uh, also, with the use of what's called a, a super uh, a D superheater, you can heat the water in your in your building uh, for free with the uh, waste heat from the from the uh, action of the system. 
Uh, as far as manufacturing is concerned, and I think Herb will get into this in mo much more detail later, but just as a real quick and simple diagram showing what I, the uh, <coughs> interior unit of a geothermal heat pump kind of looks like inside. You've, uh, ma major components include the compressor at the bottom center. You've got the, the heat exchanger coil to the right. You've got uh, various valves and fans and, and, uh, and of course, the pump to circulate the water uh, through your uh, underground loop system outside the building. Um, and, of course, in, in the entire uh, construction of one of these units, you've got copper pipe, you've got sheet metal enclosures, you've got screws, this, that, and the other. There's many, many uh, manufacturable components involved in geothermal heat pumps. Uh, I've mentioned the ground loop. and. I finally get it to a slide that, that shows that for you, that there are several ways to connect your home or building. Uh, common is the horizontal loop where you excavate uh, six to ten feet, uh, lay in your ground loops of uh, <coughs> high-density polyethylene pipe for circulation. You can drill wells, excuse me, boreholes. We have that, uh, that uh, question all the time. It's, we aren't drilling wells, we're drilling boreholes because they're closed up almost immediately after the loop system is installed. But the vertical loop, uh, as long as you have the, the, the proper number of feet that you, you know, these, these units are designed for a certain size, a loop field for the size of the building. And let's say the building requires 1,500 feet of loop, you can do that horizontally or you could do it vertically. For instance, you have three boreholes 500 feet deep would equal your 1,500. Um, there are other ways of, uh, tapping the heat from the ground, uh, also through a water well loop, a pond loop, you can drop coils into a pond, works very well. Uh, very well. And also standing, standing column well, which are relatively common in the Northeast, um, especially on commercial jobs, on larger jobs, where you actually hook into the groundwater. Uh, Geothermal heat pumps are very efficient in our transfer of heat. Uh, as I've mentioned before, that efficiency is one of our key uh, positive aspects. Uh, for it, geothermal heat pump systems do use electricity a little bit. They've got to run the pumps and the compressor and so forth in order to tap the heat from the ground. But for every kilowatt of electricity that we use in a GHP system, a geothermal heat pump system, we pull three to five kilowatts of energy from the earth, so that yields four to six kilowatts of energy for the building, which totals up to four to six hundred percent efficiency. And that's, that's our true selling point is the efficiency, and not only that, but the comfort, and there are other aspects of, of uh, heat pump use that are uh, very, very favorable for buildings and, and their uh, occupants. So geothermal heat pumps, they, they really they, they slash home and building energy use by approximately 50 percent. Uh, you see a standard uh, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning home, that's HVAC on the left, uh, compared to a geothermal home on the right. And the green area is geothermal energy. And this is from the Department of Energy. They're very, uh, very bullish on geothermal heat pumps. And you know, the reason is simple. It's, it's all about ground versus air temperatures. So ground temperatures are a, a heck of a lot more moderate and stable than air temperatures, especially in the summertime. We're all feeling it and have felt it this summer. The air temperatures can be very volatile and extreme. All you need to do is go onto the roof of a commercial building with the black tar and, and uh, 130, 140 degrees on that roof during the summer. And that, that, those air-to-air -air heat pump systems up there are really struggling to uh, be efficient, where if a geothermal system is being used, it's tapping that at much more moderately temperature, uh, temperature air drawn from the earth and uh, you know, through, through the water system, through the, uh, the piping system that, that hooks into the geothermal heat pump itself. So uh, that's, that's one of the keys that, that make us much more efficient than standard air-to-air -air systems. Um, Here's a graphic example uh, that was just uh, calculated recently of a McDonald's store in Pensacola, Florida. Uh, that's another good point is that geothermal heat pump systems are, there are 50 state technology. Uh, they're all the way from Alaska to uh, Florida. The ground temperatures do vary, 
but that can all be designed into the system. So you see the, uh, the, uh, the energy use differential here at the McDonald's store. Uh, as far as the market's concerned, I'll give you a few perspectives there. Uh, currently, we're installing about 85,000 units annually. Uh, the average system residential is three tons and costs about $17,000 to install. And there's been around a million and a half uh, geothermal heat pumps installed in the past 30 years or so. The technology's been around longer than that, but uh, the industry has really uh, been working uh, as it is now for about the past two or three decades. So you can see from the slide that we've doubled in the past decade, although things have slowed down during the uh, during the recession. Uh, we're about a we're, we're easily a one and a half billion dollar a year domestic industry. Uh, we're putting in about 670 megawatts of thermal uh, renewable uh, geothermal capacity per year. That compares to a handful of megawatts by the hot geothermal industry. And we really believe that we're poised to explode uh, as far as sales go when the U.S. economy rebounds and new housing starts to really take off again. At least that's our hope. Uh, the share of our housing market now, you can see it's down here. It's just very, very tiny. Uh, we're less than 5% of new single-family uh, uh, heating and ventilation air conditioning systems in 2010. At the same time, it's, it's interesting, Europe has really embraced geothermal heat pumps over the past several decades, and they install a million geothermal heat pumps every year. So we've got a lot of catching up to do, but there's a lot of market there for us, too. Uh, North American geothermal heat pump industry shipments. Uh, this data is a little out of date. It's a little old. It goes back to about 2011. Um, but you can see that new homes are about 30%, existing homes retrofits were 70%. Commercial now is dominant uh, during the recession, uh, about 60% of the total. And we held our own pretty well during the early years of the recession because we have a very substantial federal income tax credit that reduces that upfront cost for people. Uh, but I think that many, many retrofits were done, so we're beginning to experience somewhat of a decline in sales. But we're all hearing about the economy improving every day, so we expect to jump right back out of that. Uh, this gives you an idea from 2010 at least. Um, sorry that we don't have more recent data available. But from 2010, that reported shipments were the highest in Pennsylvania, Ohio, New York, Indiana. You can see it's a really Midwest-dominated industry, but other states are uh, getting more and more into geothermal as well. Uh, just, just quickly, you'd be surprised at the buildings that you've seen or perhaps even been in that are, are uh, heated and cooled by geothermal. Many, many government uh, buildings, institutional buildings, churches, schools, and uh, such as that. Uh, the U.S. Department of Defense, uh, they are really bullish on geothermal heat pumps. Many, many of their bases, here's just a handful of them shown in this slide, uh, utilize geothermal heat pumps in barracks and, and uh, office buildings and so forth. Um, they, uh, they look to geothermal heat pumps to make their energy use more efficient uh, you know, across the, the armed services. Uh, General Services Administration, GSA, which owns and leases uh, the federal buildings that, that uh, we use every day, uh, they uh, issued a GSA P100 order uh, recently, uh, a few years ago, that demands that any new uh, heating and cooling system is being considered, has to con also consider geothermal on a life cycle basis, and guess what? We win every time. They also... Uh, uh, demand that if a geothermal heat pump system is installed, that it be monitored for its efficiency. So look forward over the years to perhaps having that data available to us. Uh, the federal tax incentives I mentioned, uh, they're enforced through 2016. They were passed um, during the Bush administration uh, with some alterations after the uh, Obama administration took over. But basically, they, uh, for residential uh, units, they reimburse 30% of the total system cost. That's for the loop field and the, uh, the interior equipment. Um, can be used to offset the alternative minimum tax, uh, can be combined with other credits. 
uh, and then there's certain eligibility requirements, one of which is very important that the heat pump meet Energy Star requirements set by the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, that's important to all of our manufacturers and their equipment does meet those specs. Uh, the tax incentives on the commercial side, uh, compared to residential, it's only 10%, uh, but the, uh, it also includes uh, accelerated depreciation. You see that in the, uh, the, the second highlighted area, that this, this bonus depreciation that's available through the end of this year is 50% right off the first year. So over uh, uh, the first few years of a project, these uh, accelerated depreciations can be very, very lucrative for the owners. And there are a number of state incentives for geothermal heat pumps. 37 states have financial incentives, 28 have regulatory incentives, and 36 have utility uh, incentives uh, for uh, geothermal heat pump uh, installations. And utility interest uh, is growing. Uh, it's not like it used to be years and years ago, but that's one of our issues that uh, my organization is working on. So the potential market drivers for the industry and also for potential manufacturers uh, servicing the industry would be continuation of the federal and state tax credits, delivered energy costs. That's really important. You know, when fuel oil prices and natural gas prices go down, uh, it reduces the incentive for people to switch their systems to save money. Right now, we're facing that with natural gas. Uh, also, uh, the variability and availability of utility and state financing uh, programs. Uh, and something new on the horizon that, that I'm really interested in is zero energy buildings, net zero buildings and homes. I think that might be a real potential market upcoming. Uh, zero energy buildings depend on photovoltaics on the roof and to generate electricity for their appliances and so forth. So it makes a lot of sense in that environment to install a geothermal heat pump system to take that heavy load of heating and cooling off of the electric system since you're generating it yourself with expensive cells on the roof. So in combination, you can create nice homes that are completely free of the grid. So our market challenges, uh, consumer awareness and confidence. Like I say, we have a very small uh, slice of the uh, overall HVAC uh, industry. Uh, our biggest problem it remains is the high first cost. Uh, you know, when you say to somebody that ins installing a system is going to cost them twenty thousand uh, dollars, that's that's quite a uh, quite an eye opener. However, if you take advantage of the thirty percent federal tax credit, that, that knocks six thousand off of it right there. You're down to fourteen thousand, and a typical uh, replacement of a of a standard system for a twenty five hundred square foot home is going to cost you in excess of ten thousand dollars. So your price differential at that point is not very much. And if you take advantage of any local or utility uh, uh, incentives, you can pretty much break even on that. Uh, and we've got to remember that you start saving money on your monthly bill immediately. Uh, we need, uh, as always, very qualified designers and installers, uh, qualified drillers. Uh, David will speak to that. Uh, energy savings right now are not appraised or appreciated by the real estate industry. Uh, we're working on that through various uh, mechanisms. We really need utility partnering promotion and innovation. When we say equal treatment under environmental rules, uh, that's mainly to do with uh, drilling. Uh, often uh, state or local regulations look at a borehole for a geothermal system and call it a well and put it under the same kinds of restrictions for groundwater rules that uh, a water well would be under, which is totally unfair to our system because we don't affect the groundwater. And also, we need the strong industry voices, which is what we are working at. And we'd like to have a DOE program dedicated to research for lowering costs and so forth. So where are we at? You know, we've got a certain number of policy cha challenges, and we really don't fit into existing boxes. Are we efficiency or renewable? Well, the answer is that we're both. Are we geothermal or are we a building technology? That's, this is more geared towards the U.S. Department of Energy. Well, the fact of the matter is we're both right now. Their program for us is tucked away in the buildings technology section, and we just don't really get a whole lot of play. Uh, good or bad? Well, some people accuse us of using, uh, using more electricity, but at the same time, we decrease fossil use, and we offset our use of electricity by pulling renewables out of the ground. Uh, but we do have continuing problems with uh, poor design and installation in the wrong places. This is uh, a bugaboo of the industry that we're chasing down wherever we can. Uh, to try to get the bad players out of the, out of the uh, picture. 
So all in all, we. Yep. Okay. Uh, we. The, the the upshot is is that we feel we deserve more respect. Uh, Geo is working on a number of initiatives, support for research, support for data collection, inclusion of our our technology and energy efficiency legislation. Of course, we want to retain our tax credits. Uh, working at state level with uh, state level associations, uh, supporting green building initiatives and partnering with uh, other organizations for uh, uh, efficiency and more installation. So what it boils down to, to sum it up, with GEO, you've got no surprises, you got no threats, you have no cleanups, and best of all, you've got no regrets. So if you'd like more information about geothermal heat pumps, go to our website, uh, geoexchange.org. Also, the International Ground Source Heat Pump Association has a wealth of technical and other information. Uh, they're at Oklahoma State, ICSPA at okstate.edu. And you can jot down our phone number. Uh, someone, will, if, if not right when you call, will get back with you to answer your questions. So with that, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Seth. And let me quickly take back the roll and we'll unmute Herb. Herb, you should be there and I should be switching over here. Okay, thanks, Linda. And, and thanks, Ted, for the nice job on that presentation. Um, okay, go. thanks. I just want to make sure everybody can see the presentation. Um, so as Ted mentioned, I'm going to talk to you about supply chain opportunities in geothermal clean energy. My name's Herb Batroni. I put my email on the first and last slide. Um, in case there's anything you want to discuss with me um, after the webinar. But I work for um, a geothermal equipment manufacturer, and I'm responsible for um, the company's supply chain initiatives as well as our operations in Asia Pacific. Um, so uh, one of the things I want to talk to you about is size the market. And uh, I want to talk about that just for a minute before we switch to that slide where I size the market. As I'm covering supply chain opportunities, one of the things I think everybody on the line is going to be interested in are what are the total opportunities if you supply somebody that manufactures equipment that serves the geothermal market. So um, where Ted was mentioning 85,000 geothermal systems a year, the equipment that we manufacture that actually uses ground source in commercial applications can also be installed using a separate water source. And that water source could actually come from a cooling tower. And so when I size the market, it's going to be quite a bit higher because when we manufacture our products, actually go some are used from ground source and some are used from a cooling tower. But since my part of the presentation was the size of the supply um, base opportunities, I thought everybody would want to know what the total opportunities are volume-wise. Um, then we're going to talk about the ties to the air source products because most of the folks that supply um, geothermal also supply um, air source folks. And then we'll get pr pr pretty specific into the six or seven key components. So next slide, please. So as I mentioned, um, when we look at the market that we serve, there's about 180,000 systems installed a year, and that's a combination of ground source and also boiler tower. They go into residential and commercial applications, and that's domestic. International, um, it's, it's hard to tell. There's an international market for this product, primarily through um, the UK, Europe, and Asia, but the data is not recorded or available. Um, but we do know in Europe the technology is very widely accepted as, um, as in Europe and Asia. And when, when you get outside of the United States, predominantly the residential systems that are used in those applications are mini splits. So if you look outside of the U.S., 
you're going to find um, geothermal or water source applications will be used mostly in either commercial applications or large villa projects. Next slide, please. So I think it's important as before we get into the specific components that we use and the opportunities, it's important to understand um, that, you know, even though our technology competes with the air source technology, the supplier, almost all of the suppliers that supply components to um, the original equipment manufacturers in the ground source area also supply to the air source folks. And so on the air side, there's about 5 million units sold annually. So when you look at the supply chain opportunities, you really need to understand that if you're going to supply um, the companies that provide ground source and water source products, you also would have an opportunity to supply the air source um, OEMs also. The supply base is pretty much mature. It's entrenched. And um, most of the suppliers, you know, 10, 15 years ago, almost everything was domestic. Now most of the suppliers are either U.S. companies and they own operations or have joint ventures in China and Mexico, or they are domestic um, companies, they're national companies in China and Mexico that export product in the United States. So next slide. I just wanted to show you real quickly um, a picture of what a residential unit would look like. They're about four foot tall. They're about two foot wide. The commercial units, you know, obviously are a lot larger. These units, um, the picture on the screen is what you will find that will serve um, a residence. And then the larger commercial systems you'll use in the commercial buildings. On the next slide, basically you just get a breakdown of the key components and we're going to go into um, the top six on the next six slides. The top six components, compressors, the coax heat exchangers, air coils, controls, sheet metal, and motors make up a little over 80% of the cost of the materials in, in a unit. Now, that's not counting um, the next topic, which is going to be what it takes to actually install the unit, but this is basically what our company and the companies that make the equipment will typically spend on key components. So if you go to the next slide, please, um, we're going to talk about, and, and you obviously I put these in order as the most expense to the least expense, but the most expensive unit, or the most expensive component in our units is the compressor, and that's basically the heart of the system. Um, one thing that's interesting on, on this component is it's common with air source. So the suppliers that make um, this product for our industry also make um, basically the same product. Every one of them, you know, it might have a stronger motor. Um, it might have just a little difference inside, but it's basically the same product. They're made uh, mostly in Mexico and China, very few still in the U.S. You get one per unit. And if you look inside, because I think it's always important to know what's inside of these components, but it's basically copper, steel, and aluminum. And I noted on this slide, because you're going to see a change um, in the future over the next decade or so, that variable speed or in, inverter-driven units that provide a lot higher efficiency and um, less energy usage is basically something that's moving, uh, that technology is moving um, from Asia Oh, and Europe over to the states, and that's becoming more and more predominant in um, ground source products that we build. So the next slide is a coax heat exchanger, and they basically, um, it's like a tube inside a tube, so you'll have a copper tube or a nickel tube, and it's twisted, and then it's put inside um, a steel tube, and that's the refrigerant runs through for heat exchange and there's one or two per unit. This is also how you can generate um, hot water, um, as Ted mentioned earlier. Now, this product is not common with air source, and um, typically the sources that manufacture in the United States, manufacture the equipment, will buy the heat exchangers from United States-based companies. There are um, some companies that manufacture this type of heat exchanger in China, but as of this point, 
they've not made their way to the U.S. market yet. The next slide is air coils, and it's basically um, either, well, and I, on this example, because the picture shows aluminum tube, aluminum fin, but it could be um, copper tube and aluminum fin, and this product is common with air source, and basically it's the other half of the heat exchanger. There's one per unit, and as we talked about, typically that a U.S. manufacturer, because of the size, and a lot of, a lot of this is metals, and really when you get just to the price of metals, you don't have the advantage in Asia in low-cost countries because you're basically buying off of futures markets. So you'll find that they're made in the U.S. for the U.S. market and made in Asia for the Asia market. The next component is controls, and they're also in common um, with air source products. They're made in the U.S. Um, they'll take two to three per unit depending on the complexity of the unit. Variable speed units will have three or four controls in it. But they're primarily made in the U.S. because there, there's a big tie-in between um, the engineers that design our products and the logic that goes into making these controls. So this is a pretty sophisticated control, and it's not really something that um, one of the two parties, either the manufacturer of the equipment or the manufacturer of controls, um, specs it individually. So they work on this control together, and because of that, um, the manufacturer of these controls are predominantly in the U.S. And the next slide um, basically just shows um, a couple examples of sheet metal, and that's uh, basically um, sheet steel, and it's different, you call it gauges or thousandths, but it, it could run from 23 thousandths of an inch thick up to maybe 35 or 40 thousandths of an inch thick. And that sheet metal is um, formed, there's holes punched in it, press breaks um, after it's stamped out, and then typically you'll apply insulation and then it's powder coated. And some of the steel, you know, the steel's a mix um, depending on the international steel market between domestic steel and then um, inner foreign steel, but most of the fabricators for this product, it's either fabricated by the equipment OEM or they will have fabricators close to their facility. And the next slide, um, the, the, another critical component are the motors. And there are, these type of motors are also common with the air source product. They're made um, in Mexico or China, and there's usually one per unit. And as with a compressor, inside the motor is electrical grade steel, and then there's um, copper and aluminum for the windings. And so again, um, I wanna thank everybody for um, their time, and my email's at the bottom if there's anything you might wanna discuss with me after the webinar. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Herb. Let me... Switch over here then to David. There, David, you should be on and we should all be able to hear you. We both hit the unmute button at the same time. Uh, good afternoon. My name is David Henrik uh, with Burgess and Caswell. I am going to give you guys a quick look at the dirt side of the geothermal work. Uh, Burgess and Caswell is a drilling contractor that's been performing and installing geothermal systems for almost 20 years, actually over 20 years. And we worked everywhere from Washington to Pennsylvania to Oklahoma. So we've had some, some pretty broad experience in the field. and. I'm going to kind of introduce the stages of what happens outside the building and kind of show you what, uh, what's being used and what's being installed. There we go. I'll swap that. I thought a fun way to start this off would a manufacturing presentation would, shoot, would be to show off the manufacturing of one of our drill rigs that we recently purchased um, actually is one of the largest upfront costs of really getting into the market. New drill rigs, and we use moderately sized drill equipment, um, they run about a half million to $600,000 in, in the north. 
Um, so it's, there's just the equipment that's used to install the borings, drill the borings for geothermal systems. There's a lot of pieces and components, and there's several manufacturers. There's um, companies out there that build everything in-house, but then there's several drill manufacturers that contract out um, contract out for parts and pieces for their equipment. Um, moving into the loop field, during the drilling process, we use several primary products. Um, the the biggest, the most voluminous product we use, obviously, is the pipe. Um, we just recently finished a project at Ohio State University. It was a about a year and a half long project, and that project by itself used over half a million feet of inch and a quarter pipe just for the loop piping itself, not counting any of the horizontal piping for the system. Um, so it's a one of the, the largest commodity used in the in the field is the pipe. Uh, we also, during the drilling process, use a lot of bentonite uh, and polymers. But during the drilling process itself, um, there's not a lot of, you know, a lot of the construction is handled by the equipment itself, um, and the product we install is primarily the pipe. Um, after a pipe's been installed, they they use uh, a process called grouting, was where, where traditionally most people are using a bentonite-based slurry to grout back the hole. The, your typical commercial project um, will use somewhere on the order of 150,000 pounds of bentonite, um, which translates into several truckloads of material. Uh, that's one of the things actually they wanted to kind of highlight, to highlight was the the um, delivery. We use, I mean, truckloads and truckloads and truckloads worth of materials come into these commercial geothermal sites. Um, and, and I'm primarily going to focus on commercial because the numbers are more fun to talk about. Residential is a is a nice market as well, um, but it's a little harder to quantify because people don't keep near as good a track of what happens on a, on a residential as they do on commercial projects. Um, and the sourcing of the products, when you're starting to buy in truckloads, um, the sourcing really kind of spreads out because uh, we've investigated having, being as how we work nationally, we've investigated, you know, setting up remote office locations. But really from a logistical standpoint, when you're bringing things in in such large quantities, you really can reach from a lot of different places. Because when you're talking about a, a, an entire truckload of materials, um, you know, our bentonite, a lot of our bentonite will come from out west or from Texas. Um, a lot of the pipe, we get pipe anywhere from Michigan, Nebraska, uh, and that distributes to projects all over the country. So the sourcing and shipment is not near as localized as like the residential market where you're talking to smaller quantities. Um, the sourcing usually comes out of smaller supply houses and things of that nature. So if, if you kind of remember back to one of Ted's slides where he showed the whole system where he had the house up with the, the heat pump inside and the piping in the ground, um, this is a this is a example of, of what we would go through on a on a vertical installation. And when you're talking about commercial systems, you're talking generally about hundreds or hundreds and hundreds of borings. That Ohio State project I referenced was something on the order of 500 borings, and it took up two different parcels or two different properties on the campus that were then joined into uh, a couple of residence halls. So commercial projects can get quite big. Um, here's an example of what we go through after the loops have been installed on the ground and start doing the horizontal piping. And there is, we're using, up in, up in the horizontal piping, we're using uh, multiple sizes of pipes anywhere from three-quarter inch up to maybe even 12 inch high density polyethylene and it's all this is all piping that will end up coming into the building um, which will be the, the conduit that's carrying those fluids from the building to the field once that that horizontal piping has been done then we would then bring the piping into either manifolds or vaults Depending on how much building space is available, sometimes you'll see the manifolds mounted right inside the building. Uh, a lot of the times you'll see those those vault 
those bigger manifolds installed in vaults actually out in the geothermal field. Uh, the manifolds they use a lot more um, they use a lot more different parts and pieces. And out in the field, it's almost all high density polyethylene piping, uh, bentonite drilling fluids and grouts, um, silica sand for enhancement of the bentonites. Um, but when you start getting into actual mechanical interfacing into the building, you're going to start seeing valves, balancing valves, ports, pressure gauges, temperature gauges, uh, fittings, flanges, bolts. There's a lot, a larger variety of parts and pieces that go into the manifolding. And on the left is what we had to manufacture for that Ohio State project. They had some fairly unique manifold designs and manufacturing opportunity there because we really could not find anybody that could build it, so we ended up essentially having to construct uh, their, let's just construct the panel folds right by ourselves. Okay, so a quick rundown of the products that are used in the different phases. Uh, drilling, we're using bentonite drilling fluids, drill rods, bits, and other drill tools. Uh, that's obviously an industry that also crosses over into oil drilling and water well drilling as well. We're using all the same kind of tools, which is all kind of controlled through API which makes it kind of a nice industry to work in because there's a lot of standards and standardization, which means you kind of get, can, can, it's, everything's adaptable. Um, when you're drilling, you also may use steel, a lot of steel pipe. Uh, at that Ohio State project, we used something on the order of 55,000 feet of six inch pipe that ended up kind of, ended up just being grouted in place. The steel pipe acts as an interface to get down through uh, looser formations that you can't drill through. And then, of course, and then we use some drilling fluids and additives in our bentonite drilling mud. In the loop well installation, we've got high density polyethylene pipe, bentonite grout, silica sand that you add to the grout to allow the borehole to exchange heat with the formation better. And you use a lot of pipe cutters or the small hand tools to fit the pipe and, and seal and cap everything. Uh, one of the odd things that, that people overlook a lot, we use boxes and boxes and boxes of duct tape, probably pallets of duct tape at, at bigger jobs uh, for the fastening tremie pipes, fastening loop weights. Um, it's, it's actually a, a product that's used quite a bit in large volumes. Um, disposable weights, that's an industry where we're really um, in order to insert loops in boreholes, in order to counter the buoyancy effects of having water or drilling mud in a borehole, typically there are weights that are fastened to the bottom of loops. Uh, it's not something that anybody's really approached. It's always something that we've always tried to find secondary uses for used up equipment, um, where like in, in the irrigation market, they'll have line shaft turbine pumps and we typically will find old turbine shafts that are that a company's pulled out of installations, um, and we'll buy them, you know, pennies on the pound, and essentially use those as our loop weights. Portland cement. If you're in states like Minnesota and Michigan, uh, where I'm from, Minnesota, we operate out of Minnesota. Those boreholes, when they go down into bedrock formations, limestone, sandstones, require Portland cement, and that ends up being a when you start getting into Portland cement in fractured bedrock formations, that ends up being a product that you use in very, very high volumes. When you get through with the, the loop installation, you go into the entrench headers and you end up using, as I said, a, a wide range of high density polyethylene pipes, typically between three quarters to four inch coming up, leading up to the manifolds. A lot of fittings, T's, elbows, reducing T's. Everywhere that there's a, a loop that needs to be connected to that horizontal pipeline, there's a fitting. And so we'll go through boxes and boxes of fittings on every job. Heat fusion iron spaces and other equipment. There's really only a couple manufacturers right now that are producing the kind of tools for heat fusion, McElroy, Ritmo. Uh, there may be one other out there. But it's a... Uh, 
it's a process that you know our, our company owns a dozen heating irons. Um, it's it, it's something that's a need, but something that's pretty. The options are pretty limited right now. We use tracer wire again uh, to layer over the top of all that header pipe for tracing of the fields after they've been installed. Foil back tape and occasionally you'll see styrofoam insulation installed over the top of the piping for frost protection. And when you get into the manifolds, when you're connecting those headers to the manifolds uh, in those vaults or in the building, you'll see, start seeing larger diameter high density polyethylene pipe, four inches, up, four inches and up. Typically you won't see a lot of pipelines bigger than 12 inches in geothermal. You use a lot of butterfly valves, a butterfly valve at every where every header connects to the manifold, balancing valves generally are installed on each connection. Um, pressure, temperature, and flow sensors as, as DDC controls continue to evolve. Um, there's more digital interface with these systems, kind of monitoring their health. Um, flanges, adapters, a lot of pipe insulation, as you saw in one of the previous pictures. And propylene glycol. Uh, a lot of these systems, as Ted said, a lot of these systems are Water filled. Uh, when you get into more northern climates, where they're pulling some heat, you know, where they're extracting more heat from the system, they may even uh, add an antifreeze, which is typically a propylene glycol, and we'll end up using propylene glycol by the tanker full. And the propylene glycol is nice because it's already usually stocked full of inhibitors, um, and propylene glycol by itself in higher concentrations is a biocide or a bacterial inhibitor at minimum. Uh, so, thank you guys. I appreciate the time uh, to talk to you, and uh, please contact me at my email address or give me a call if you ever have any questions about fields or design. Thanks a lot. Dan, David, and um, we will now turn over to the portion uh, asking questions. If by chance you called in, um, and aren't on the computer, you could push star six to unmute your line to go ahead and ask the question. Otherwise, if you are on the computer, feel free to just type your question in using the chat feature. I will work here to unmute all of our presenters. It's just going to take a bit here. Sorry about that. Ted unmuted. Let me find Herb. And even amongst the speakers, if you guys have any questions with each other. I think everybody did a great job. David, you're right yeah. on the mark with all of your detail, and you as well, Herb. Yeah. Got a question here. Um, what role can the technology, say software designers and programmers, play in elevating this industry in the U.S.? <laughs> well, I, I guess I'll I'll field that question if you guys don't mind, because one of our Burgess, one of our family of companies in here actually distributes and develops a software package called Ground Loop Design, which is one of the software packages that's used in something like 50 different countries. We have it in 14 different languages. And so when it comes to software modeling of actual loop fields, um, understanding the theory uh, and really kind of condensing all the information out there for the, that you'd have to pull together to put together some kind of programming package um, is pretty sophisticated. Um, when you start to talk into BIM, you know, building information modeling, there's a lot of area there because there's pretty, Asher's done a good job of setting down uh, standards and, and really they've charted a lot of good information and there's really 
a need to evolve how we model buildings when you look at them in terms of marrying them to a geothermal system because typically in the past you just look at the kind of a peak maximum load for a building put in your equipment and count on your gas line or electric line to feed your boilers or chillers. Well, when you're going down to a geothermal system, you know, the, the earth can only transmit so much energy so fast and so long. So you need to quantify your energy, which means you need to get down to monthly or daily or hourly modeling of how a, of a building's energy needs. And so there's a, there's a lot of growth, and there's some companies that are working on that now, but it's still an area that's in need of, of pretty solid evolution. Yeah. Another question, are there any alternatives to the HDPE plastic? I'll field that one again, I guess. Um, Dave Henrik again. Um, high density polyethylene, there is crosslink polyethylene. There's several other types of pipe type that have been used. Um, in most of the economic models I've run, even using some of the, the more creative heat exchangers that are being developed, and, and there is room for uh, developing higher end heat exchangers, uh, particularly in residential applications because residences don't put uh, stress on the earth like a commercial building can. When you get into design of ground loops, um, typically those fields are using the earth to the, its maximum heat transfer capability over time. So improving the ground loop um, in those aspects is pretty tough because high density polyethylene is relatively inexpensive as it is. So you're, you're talking about having to make some kind of cost benefit because the earth is a limiting factor, not the heat exchanger. In residential applications, that's not the case. There is definitely some, um, some need for innovation in uh, how we exchange heat with the earth where smaller loads are involved. Okay. So question here kind of about the cost. I've heard the cost of installation for a home, say a 2,500 square foot home, is about $10,000. Is that correct? And does that include all of the costs? Um, what would be the payback period for something like that um, on the current cost of gas, assuming the 30% grant? Guys, I'll give that a shot if you don't mind. Fire. Um, we, GEO did a, uh, a telephone survey over a few day period in the spring and nationwide what we found was about a $17,000 average for a three ton system, which I am told is about the right size for a 2,000 to 2,500 square foot house. That would be total system cost. That would include the excavation, the, the uh, heat exchanger in the ground, the equipment in the house and so on. Um, payback is, of course, variable, but as I've mentioned in my presentation, if you take advantage of the 30% uh, tax credit now available from the federal government, uh, you would knock that down by, what is that, $5,100, so you'd be down to, say, around $12,000. Uh, if you lived in Illinois, for example, you could you up another couple thousand dollar credit from your local utility. So you could conceivably knock that $17,000 down to the 10,000 that you mentioned. And if your heating bill, a heating and cooling bill per year is $2,000 and you cut it in half, uh, you're saving $1,000 a year, you have a 10 year payback. It's pretty simple math when you get down to it. Uh, typically we tell people uh, that um, you can have a payback in the three to seven year range. Um, and then you also have to consider that um, when we talk about payback, uh, often it's, it's looked at, well, how, how long is it going to take me to pay back the whole system? Well, you know, if, if you're using a natural gas and electric uh, air to air system, uh, you don't hear people talk about paybacks with that. They just say, well, I've got to have a heating and cooling system in my house. That's part of the cost of living. Um, so to, to my mind, uh, your payback should be based upon 
the difference in cost between geothermal and a standard system. And if indeed that cost on a $17,000 system is about $7,000, well, you've taken care of that already with your uh, tax credits and your other incentives to the, for geothermal. So the way I see it, uh, your payback is almost immediate because you're saving money every month out of pocket. I can actually take Ted's payback um, example and take that one step further. Uh, if you look at the cost of installing the geo geothermal system and you roll that up into a 30-year mortgage, your cost of living on day one, you'll experience net positive gain day one because when you install that geothermal system in your home, you may see a, a, an increase in your mortgage of, 30 to 40 dollars a month on that average home and what you'll experience in savings though on average you'll experience savings of 50 to 60 dollars per month so you'll have a net savings of 30 to 40 dollars right on day one when you step in that house if you if you roll that geothermal system to a 30-year mortgage and that's one of the things i tell people around here if you're building a new home there is a financial case to put that heat pump in every single new home because I can probably show you how you can save money day one in that house even though your mortgage will increase. And David's talking about new construction on retrofits. Uh, I've learned that uh, in an older home uh, you can often finance that system and if you look at the, uh, the your monthly cost to finance the system versus your energy savings, as David was pointing out, you could very well be in the same boat, that you are saving money out of pocket immediately. Well, thanks a lot, everybody, or all three of you guys, for sharing your knowledge and helping us get up to speed in this industry. Um, September, we will again we'll cover a variety of clean energy opportunities, giving you that quick overview of the opportunities that are available in these clean energy sectors. And if you do have any questions, feel free to give me a call or an email. I will, in the next, if, at worst case, by Tuesday, you should get an email from me with the slides attached. Thanks a lot, everybody, and have a great Labor Day weekend. Great. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you.